I have always had a soft spot in my heart uh, for a certain kind of athlete. Uh, perhaps best personified by this guy. If you don't know who that is, uh, that is Matthew Delvadova. If you don't know him, that's not a surprise. Most people wouldn't have a clue who he is. As a basketball player, he's, well, he's remarkable compared to me, but by NBA standards, there's really nothing particularly remarkable about him. Uh, he's not particularly tall. Uh, his card says he's 6'2", which probably means he's like 5'11", because they lie on those things. So he's shorter than me. Um, he's not the, the fastest. He's not the biggest. He's not the strongest. Uh, he's a below average shooter by NBA standards. Um, he's not, he doesn't exactly jump out of the gym. He's played 10 years in the NBA. He has the same amount of dunks as I do. Okay? In fact, he does nothing particularly exceptional compared to his peers at the NBA level other than he might play harder than anybody you've ever seen play on a basketball court. His most famous moment is actually from 2015. He exhausted himself to the point that they took him straight from the floor by ambulance to the hospital to give him IV and potassium because his body was cramping up so badly he couldn't walk to the locker room. No one has gotten more out of the talents they had than a guy like Matthew Delvadova. And if you pay attention, sports is full of guys like that. Guys who aren't the fastest, who aren't the biggest, who aren't the strongest, who aren't the best, but they get the absolute most out of what God has given them. And they're fun to watch. They're fun to root for because we look at them and go, man, I could never be the 6'9 guy who jumps out of the gym and shoots the lights out, but that's, that's something you can aspire to. Somebody who just takes what they have and gets the absolute most out of everything they've been given. And to his credit, he's played 10 years in the league, he's made a whole bunch of money, and he gets to wear an NBA championship ring around simply because he's made the most out of what he was given. But we're starting a, a new study over the next few weeks that kind of come out of the Easter series we've just been talking about. If you're joining us for the first time in a while, we spent six weeks kind of walking through the gospel using the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe as these kind of analogies to help us understand sin, repentance, redemption, sacrifice, and yes, even resurrection. And so kind of where this study comes from the next few weeks is, so now what? If Christ is risen from the dead, and I have given my life to him, and Corinthians says that I, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation, what does that really look like? Practically, tangibly, what does it mean that I'm a new creation? And so we're going to look at a few different ways of understanding what it means to be made new in Christ. And today, specifically, we're going to talk about this idea of new gifts, that someone who is in Christ has been given spiritual gifts for a very specific purpose. And so we're going to talk about spiritual giftedness and what the purpose of those gifts is in the church. We're going to end up in Romans chapter 12, but we're going to start in Exodus 35. If you want to turn to Exodus 35, it's not a passage most people go to when talking about spiritual gifts. I'll explain why we're going to be there. You see, in Exodus chapter 25, all the way up through basically Exodus 30, God has given directions to the people of Israel on how to build this thing called a tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle is going to be the place where God meets with his people. It's going to be the place where his presence resides. And when I say give directions, I mean like detailed directions. How big the curtains are going to be, what color they're going to be, how the loops are going to be sewn together. What's going to go inside the temple? There's a table and there's a lampstand and there's the Ark of the Covenant and how these things are going to be made and how big they're going to be and what jewels are going to go where and how the gold is going to be laid over the wood and what kind of wood we're going to... Detailed directions on building this massive, beautiful structure that was going to be the center of the people's worship of God. Now, we know a lot of things about Moses. We know he was a pretty good leader. We know that he was courageous. We know that he was a righteous judge, that he knew what God wanted. We saw him perform miracles. But nowhere in Scripture does it account that Moses would have been good at sewing curtains. That does not fall on his resume. Nowhere does it tell us that he was a great carpenter who'd be awesome at building this structure. And so one imagines, and I'm reading into this a little bit, that God is giving him page after page after page of direction on how to, 
how to carve this and lay gems and overlay gold and sew the purple thread in with the red thread on these mat. And, and he's looking at it like you look at Ikea instructions, right? <laughs> all right, so here are all the supplies. And I have this picture of what it's supposed to look like when I'm done, but I have absolutely no idea how to get from the supplies to the finished product. And so in Exodus 35, God kind of throws Moses a lifeline, so to speak. This is what he says, beginning in verse 30. Moses then said to the Israelites, Look, the Lord has appointed by name Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. He has filled him with God's spirit, with wisdom, understanding, and ability in every kind of craft to design artistic works in gold, silver, and bronze to cut gemstones for mounting, and to carve wood for work in every kind of artistic craft. He has also given both him and Ahaliab, the son of Ahizamah, of the tribe of Dan, the ability to teach others. He has filled them with skill to do the work of a gem cutter, a designer, an embroiderer in blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and fine linen, and a weaver. They can do every kind of craft and design artistic designs. Bezalel and Ahaliab and all the skilled people are to work based on everything the Lord has commanded. The Lord has given them wisdom and understanding to know how to do all the work of constructing the sanctuary. So Moses summoned Bezalel and Ahaliab and every skilled person in whose heart the Lord had placed wisdom, everyone whose heart moved him to come to the work and do it. Now that's a lot going on there, so let me just help you understand in a couple of basic ideas what's happening here. Number one, God says to the Israelites, I have supernaturally gifted these two men, whose names I'll test you on after service, so make sure you're paying attention. <laughs> Bezalel and Ahaliah, make sure you remember that. I have gifted these two men with my spirit, with the ability and the wisdom to sew and carve and craft and cut and build. The ability that they have is not of their own. They didn't get it because their dad was good at fixing things and their mom was good at sewing. I have put that ability in them. It comes from me. And because they have that ability, they are going to use it not just for their own gain, not just to build their own house and have the prettiest house on the block, to win a quilting competition that we're going to have here at the next Passover, but rather they're going to use those abilities that I gave them to build the sanctuary so that the people have a place to come and worship. They're going to take those gifts and skills that I embedded by my spirit, and they're going to use them for the benefit of the people of God. And then the one that you can just miss if you're not paying attention is verse 2 seems redundant, but it's important. Chapter 36, verse 2, it's important. Who did they call when it was time to do the work? God said, I gifted these people with these skills. I gave them all of these talents. You know what they didn't do? They didn't call the sheep herders to come build the temple. They didn't call the farmers to come build the tabernacle. They didn't call uh, the preachers to come build the tabernacle. They called the people who God had given the gift to to do the work of building the tabernacle and say, hey, God gave you the gift to do this. You should be the ones to come do it. And it, it's really, really simple, but it's really, really important. God embedded special gifts into special people for the purpose of building up his people, helping his people, and they're the ones who did the task they were made for. They did the thing God had specially equipped them to do so that the people could better worship God. It's not rocket science, but it's something that we often miss. And this idea is fast forwarded to Romans chapter 12, a more familiar passage to us when we talk about spiritual gifts. And Paul takes the same idea that you should use the gifts God has given you to do the work of the kingdom for the building up of God's people, and he makes it really, really simple. I've often called Romans 12 spiritual gifts for dummies. Okay? So I'm not calling any of you dummies. But if you happen to self-identify, this passage is for you. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 3. He says, For by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself 
more highly than he should think. Instead, think sensibly as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. Now, as we have many parts in one body, and all the parts do not have the same function, in the same way, we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. I'm going to pause, explain that, and then we'll keep reading. Your eyes are really useful for seeing things. Well, some of you not as much are getting older, but most of us, our eyes are really useful for seeing things. But our eyes are terrible for walking to another room. You would not use your eyeballs to walk somewhere. Our hands are really good for grasping things, for eating things, for picking things up, for carrying things. They're not so good at processing bile. That's the liver's job. Your hands would not be very good at that job. What Paul is saying here is stop comparing yourself to other people. Don't look at someone else and go, man, I wish I had their gifts. Or, man, I wish they were more like me because I've got it all together. Why don't they act more like me? Stop. It's not about you being the same as me. It's about you knowing you. It's about you being comfortable with who God made you to be, the grace and faith he put in you, and you being willing to use that. A body that was comprised entirely of ears would hear a lot of things but not be useful for much else. A body complies the tower of noses would stink, quite frankly. Well, it wouldn't stink, but it would smell the stink. Never mind. Um, it took just a minute. It's all right. A body that was not made up of a hundred different parts would be incredibly ineffective. And so Paul begins this conversation about gifts by going, stop, stop thinking that you're, more, you're better than someone else or they're better than you. Stop comparing yourself at all. God made you the way he made you. And he made me the way he made me. And the church needs all of those pieces working together to fulfill its purpose. And then he goes on, this is the spiritual gifts for dummies. He says, according to the grace given to us, if we have different gifts, if it is prophecy, use it according to the standard of faith. If it is service, in service. If teaching, in teaching. If exhorting or encouraging, then in exhortation. If giving with generosity, if leading with diligence, if showing mercy with cheerfulness. Let me just break that down as simple as I can. Here's what Paul says. If you are a gifted teacher, then you should teach to the glory of God and the building up of the church. If you are a gifted leader, then you should lead to the glory of God and the building up of his church. If you are gifted with the gift of encouragement, then you should encourage people to the glory of God and the building up of the church. If you've been gifted financially and have a generous heart, then you should give to others for the glory of God and the building up of the church. This is not complicated. Paul's point is this, and it's incredibly simple. You should use whatever God gave you. And this is not an exhaustive list. That's why I like to start in Exodus, because most people don't think sowing is a spiritual gift. But we find out in Exodus, they were taught to sow by the Holy Spirit. And some of you have the gift of sowing, and you can use that to the glory of God and the building up of His church. Some of you have the gift of construction and building, and you can use that to the glory of God and the building up of His church. It's not confined to these few things listed in Romans. You are to extract what gifts did God give me? And how can I use those gifts to the glory of God to build up his church? That simple. I want to I illustrate a couple of problems that happen when we talk about this. And I'm going to do so by talking about my dad for a little bit. That's my dad um, and Micah when he was little and cute. Um, <clears throat> I picked the picture, primarily two reasons. One, it shows my dad being an idiot, which now you know where I get it from. I come by it honest. And two, um, you can very clearly see one of my dad's handicaps. Uh, my dad was born without a right hand. Now, some people uh, kind of feel bad for him, whatever. I just say, it never kept my dad from doing anything he wanted to do. He always said because he was born that way, it was easier for him. Uh, my dad played college basketball. My dad played college baseball. And probably most impressively, my dad taught me how to drive in a 1988 Dodge Ram with four on the floor. Okay. <laughs> with no right hand. And he often drove it while eating a Frosty from Wendy's. <laughs> and he would pin the Frosty to the steering wheel with a stub, 
and steer this way and reach underneath with this hand and shift gears while going 70 miles an hour down the interstate. Perfectly safe. And while I tell you that it never kept my dad from doing anything, he often had to learn different ways to do things than most people learn. You want to practice, go home and tie your shoe with one hand. Put on your belt with one hand. Eat a Frosty while driving a standard transmission truck with one hand and see how it goes for you. And the way that he made that work is he learned to compensate with other parts of his body. He learned to use his stub, his elbow, in ways that most people only use hands. His left hand did a lot of work that it wouldn't normally have done. I never got to watch him play college baseball, but I remember watching him play church league softball. He played center field on the softball team, and he would catch the ball, toss it in the air, throw his glove to the ground, bare hand the ball out of the air, and throw in one motion because he just learned to adapt. He learned to do things in different, unique ways. And I want you to know that sometimes in the church, when a particular member of the body does not do their job, that's what the church has to do. We have to fill in the gaps. Things that aren't meant to function a certain way, we have to function that way anyway. Because we've got somebody who's a gifted encourager, but they don't really want to do their job. So now we've got this guy who's a builder having to try to encourage other people. And it's not as efficient, and it's not, as, it's not the way it's supposed to be, but you can fill in the gaps. We, we've got gifted teachers you don't want to teach, and so we've got the guy who's supposed to be the, the servant back there trying to teach junior high Sunday school class. And it, it, we're having class, you know, and they're learning, but it's not, it's not what it's supposed to be because we've got parts of the body made with certain gifts who refuse to use their gifts. They just want to come to church, they want to be fed, they want to hear the sermon, and they want to go home. And what happens then is the body of Christ has to adjust and adapt in ways that are less efficient, less effective in order to survive. And most of the time we make it work. My dad's other handicap, we didn't learn about until I was eight. <clears throat> My dad was diagnosed with sclerosis and cholangitis. You probably have no idea what that is. It means that the bile ducts in your liver begin to harden and they eventually stopped processing bile. And so when I was a kid, I would watch my dad turn yellow because his liver was no longer taking things out of his body. And I don't mean like, oh, he's a little jaundiced. I mean, it looked like somebody colored his eyeballs with a highlighter and that he was getting ready to audition as an Oompa Loompa in Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory, okay? Like he would turn bright yellow and orange and they'd rush into the hospital and they'd drain everything out and his color would come back and they go, huh, that's weird, I wonder what's going on. We did that for about three years. When I was 10 and a half, my dad had a liver transplant. We were told we'd get about eight or nine years with him. Hopefully, I'd make it to high school graduation before the liver failed. Um, we got 26. My dad didn't pass till I was 36 years old. But I want you to know that it was that disease and all of the treatments and procedures that flowed from that disease, the anti-rejection meds, all of the scopes, all of the radiation, that eventually took my dad's life. And I tell you that because I need you to know that that happens in the church too. That sometimes there are parts of the body who refuse to do their job and it kills the local church. No one will ever kill the church. Christ is building his church. The gates of hell itself will not prevail against the church. No one's ever going to kill the church. But I'm telling you, there are plenty of local churches that are, their doors are closed and no one meets there. And the original symptom is they had people sitting in their pews, sitting in their chairs, who came, who listened, said, great job, preacher, and who went home. And they had all of these gifts, whether it was construction or arts and crafts or encouragement or music or leadership or teaching or pre whatever their gifts may be, they had all of these gifts. But then we're going to use them for the church. Sometimes they use them to make a living. Sometimes they use them to build their own home. Sometimes they use them to be very successful in life, but they were not going to use them for the glory of God and the building up of his church. And if you have enough of those people, or if you have those people who, the gifts that you're really missing, eventually the body becomes sick and dies. And so the 
flip side of Romans 12 is what happens when the guy who has the gift of teaching chooses not to teach. And the one with the gift of leadership decides not to lead. And the one with the gift of encouragement decides not to encourage. And the one with the gift of generosity decides not to give. And the one with the gift of mercy decides not to serve. What happens to the body then? And sometimes you can just work around it. Other people step up, you find new ways to do things, and you just make do. But sometimes, sometimes the church dies because the parts did not want to do their jobs. I want to make this as personal as I can. I'll start by making it personal about me, and then I'll make it personal about you. Romans 12 is the reason I do what I do for a living. I grew up in a family of preachers. My granddad was a preacher. My dad worked in a church for about 11 years. I have two uncles who are full-time ministers. I have three cousins who have worked in churches at various points in their life. I grew up in a family of preachers. And I used to sit at Thanksgiving dinner. I'm the youngest. For a long time, I was the youngest of the grandkids. There were a couple more now, but, but I was 10, 11, 12. And all these people over me sitting around the Thanksgiving dinner table telling stories about what it was like to work in a church. I don't know if you've ever sat in that setting, but I'm just going to tell you. Churches can be mean. I don't know if you knew that or not. And usually when they're mean, they're mean to their leaders, to their elders, to their preachers, to their deacons. They're mean to the people in charge. They say mean, nasty things. They break promises. They spread rumors. They hold your kids to standards that are not fair. They ex expect things from your spouses that are not fair. And I'm a 10, 11, 12-year-old kid sitting listening to that going, I am never working in a church, ever. Ever. <laughs> this will be, I'm, I'm in my 23rd year working in a church. So what changed? What changed is Romans chapter 12. I was 17 at a week of summer camp. And on Monday night, the guy who was preaching had shared his own story of how he decided to go into ministry. Um, he was actually a student taking pre-med classes somewhere and talked about this, this this desire to fix people's hearts rather than their bodies. And he transferred schools and went to Ozark Bible College and became a, a preacher. And um, I had to, whether by Holy Spirit intervention or sheer luck or whatever, I ended up sitting at a table with him the next day at lunch. And he did what I do with students at camp. He began to interview me. Where are you from? What do you do? What do you like to do? What do you... And as I began to tell him about all the things that I had done, my life experiences. And I grew up in this small little country church where we didn't have any youth ministry if we didn't plan it. So by the time I was 17, I taught our junior high youth group every single Sunday night. I had planned three mission trips, multiple lock-ins, helped plan weeks of camp, helped plan VBSs, because there wasn't anybody else to do it. And so I had been doing all of these things. And so he looked at me and said, oh, so you're going to go into youth ministry? I said, no way, no way. And he said, why? And I began to explain to him, I don't, I don't want my family to be treated like that. I don't want to be treated like that. My my uncle was just coming off a heart attack. He'd been at this church for 10 years. They tripled in size, and they fired him um, and just broke his heart. He ended up having a heart attack like six weeks after he got fired. I was like, I, I don't want that. And so he took me to Romans 12. And he says, I only have one question for you, Josh. And I need you to be honest. I need you to look at the way God made you and ask yourself, how can I best bring glory to God and serve his kingdom? And if the answer is being a lawyer, which at that point, that's what I would have told you I was going to be. I was going to go to pre-law, I was going to be a lawyer. Because if the answer is being a lawyer, then go be a lawyer to the glory of God. We need people who are going to help those who can't help themselves. We need people who are going to act with justice and mercy in that profession. If you really think that you are gifted in that way and you can do the most good in that role, then go do it for the glory of God. And then he said, but if you think that your skills would be best served in the church, then don't run away because you're scared or because you think it might be hard or because you think you might get hurt. If God made you this way, then be faithful with what he's given you. The next night I walked down the aisle and told my family I was going to be a minister. They all looked at me and went, duh. Um... <laughs> I don't tell you that story to make myself look good because I don't think it makes me look good. 
I don't tell you that story so that you go, oh, look, Josh is doing what he's supposed to do. That, that's not the point. I tell you that story because I want you to know that there have been years of my life where I have fought with God about being obedient on this principle. It happened when I was younger. It happened right before I came here. If you had asked me six months before I came here, I would have told you I am never being a lead minister to church ever in my life. I don't want to do it. I'm still not sure I want to do it, and we're six and a half years in. I want you to know that I've struggled with this because my heart does not always want to do what God has asked me to do. And so there are times in my life where I've been like, ah, God, I know you kind of gave me this gift, but I'm really comfortable over here. And God has said, I don't care if you're comfortable. I'm going to make you to be comfortable. I made you to do this thing, so get up and go do it. And my guess is there are some of you here who know in your heart that God has made you to do certain things. I'm not saying you've got to work in a church. But he has given you gifts and talents that you are not using for his kingdom. And your list of excuses might be the same as mine. It might be different. It might be that you're afraid to fail. It might be that you're afraid to get hurt. It might be that you're too busy. Maybe you feel like you're too old or you're too young or you don't know enough. Or whatever your list of excuses might be. And I'm just telling you, the command is simple. Evaluate how God made you. And ask yourself one question. How do I use what I have to bring God glory and build up his kingdom? Then go do that. Anything else is disobedience. Anything else is an excuse. And don't let fear or busyness or worry or insecurity or peer pressure, or greed, or whatever, keep you from being obedient to what God has given you. So I'm going to end with just a simple question and a less simple challenge. The simple question is this. I want you to evaluate your heart right now and ask yourself this question. What have you done in the last week to build up God's kingdom? doesn't have to be here. Some of you have ministries at your work. Some of you have ministries at school. Some of you are counseling someone in your family. Some of you are witnessing to your... I'm just, I'm asking, kingdom-wise, what have you done in the last week where you can go, right there, that's where I use my gift to build the kingdom? I encouraged that person who needed it. I was there as a comforter for the person who lost a loved one. I, mean, I evangelized this person. Um, I, I was showed up to serve in this way. I taught this class. What have you done in the last seven days where you can point to and go, right there, I use my gifts to build up the kingdom? And then here's the challenge. If the answer is, I can't think of anything, my cell phone number is in the bulletin. And I would love to talk to you. I would love for you to call and go, listen, here's what my gifts are, and I have no idea how to use those in a way that serves. Here's what my talents and experiences are, and I want to help, but I don't even know where to get started. Text me, call me, email me, Facebook me, however you want to get a hold of me and say, can we have coffee and talk about how I can plug in, whether it's here at the church, whether it's at a mission in our community, whether it's helping a young person through, whatever your gifts are, there should never be a point in your life where you can't answer that question. There should never be a point in your life where you look at the last seven days and cannot say, here are the ways I serve the kingdom. Because you have gifts and talents that are meant to be used for the glory of God and the building up of his kingdom. And not using them is disobedience. So I'm going to ask you to evaluate your heart, to be honest with yourself. And if you need to, give me a call this week. I'd love to help you walk you through the process. We're going to sing a song here as a song of invitation that says that we would like to be servants. We like to use our gifts, just like Jesus did, to serve those around us. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing that as our prayer together. Father, we, um, we are grateful for the gifts you've given us, grateful for the talents you've put in us, the intelligence, the charisma, the relationships, 
uh, the opportunities, the skills. God, you have been so good to us. And so we praise you for those things. And we look now for ways to use those to serve the church here, yes. To serve our community, absolutely. But most importantly, to serve you. To recognize that your kingdom is of utmost importance. And we want to be a part of that journey. To recognize that one day we're going to give an account. And we, we want to be, we want to be like Matthew Delavadova. We want to be able to say we made the most of every single thing you gave us. We made the most of every opportunity, of every gift, of every talent. And so we sing these words this morning as our prayer. Make us into servants. Show us how to use those gifts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.